Well, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Optimal Bio podcast. Today we're back with Dr. Brandon. It's been a few months, so I'm grateful that we're back together again. And I noticed last week uh, you did a Instagram video uh, talking about plastics. And I know we've been down this road before um, and it kind of hit home to me about a week or so ago, um, after I went running, uh, I had to get some water. And of course, the only thing available in the uh, uh, water section of every single grocery store and or convenience store in the world is multiple brands of plastic bottles. And uh, got me thinking, and obviously you've been thinking for a while about this. So um, I thought we'd just go back to a golden oldie and talk about plastics and welcome you back to the program. So how are you doing today? Uh, Jim, fantastic. I, I do appreciate it because I do believe Optimal Bio's whole, our mission statement is we're educators and education is continuing. So uh, we may revisit an old topic, uh, see it a different view, but we have to understand how this body works because we need to be, not to be catchphrase, but optimal. There's a f phenomenal way this body could work with the proper nutrition stuff we always talked about. So Jim, I, I look forward to this afternoon. So I was running to a uh, friend of mine who is, uh, probably on the cusp of coming in to get um, hormones and to get testosterone. And uh, I was trying to explain to him that, you know, his testosterone level 30 years ago at his age would have been a lot higher than what it is today. So can you kind of walk us through why that is? And let's focus today, obviously, on the plastics and what's been going on since, you know, the 80s, 90s into the 2000s now? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, let's go over first, Jim how the brain works and, and, and how this feedback system works. Cause that plays with this whole plastic stuff. There's a part of your brain called the hypothalamus. This is all in the center of our, and right in the center of our noggin. So the hypothalamus sits on top of what's called the anterior pituitary. And there's these releasing hormones that release hormones within the anterior pituitary to go to the body. There's six major systems and all, all hormone means in Greek is initiator. It starts the process on the, um, on the sex hormone size. And this, I want to focus on this real quick, Jim. The word sex hormones does not mean for intimacy and libido. That's not why the name came from. These hormones are when the baby's in the womb differentiates male and female. That's where the phrase sex comes from. Let's leave that in that process. So what happens is FSH in males makes a uh, sperm. In females, it makes estrogen. LH in females makes progesterone in males make testosterone, but this is where the part goes back and forth. So in females where estrogen, that actually complete changes into testosterone. In males, testosterone becomes estrogen. So they go back and forth. When the system's running perfectly, what turns off the production of the hormones? It's when the estrogen reaches a critical mass. So estrogen goes back to the hypothalamus again, and then turns off the production. Works a great system. But what if, Jim, what if we got extra estrogen from outside of our bodies. What would happen? Your body would say, I got enough, we'll produce less. And that's what happens. They're called xenoestrogens. They're in a class called neuroendocrine interrupters. So that's how the system works. So when you talk about these levels, we're getting plastic, we're getting xenoestrogen, plastics being one of the major ones that are actually um, Roundup's another, um, atrazine, insecticides, pesticides, there's a bunch of others, but let's focus on plastics tonight. Plastics is a big estrogen mimicker. So that's what's been happening the last 30, 40, 50 years. And each, you can look, each generation, each 10 years, there's a, there's a lower starting point of testosterone in males and in females. So I was listening to this podcast uh, about a month or two ago, and they had a doctor on, and they're called, I think they're called phylates. Is that the, uh -huh. the, the pronunciation? Phthalates. Phthalates. Uh -huh. And she was talking about, you know, when the baby's in the womb, um, and you would obviously can explain this better than me since you're an OBGYN, uh, <laughs> but you know, the body basically turns on a signal, which produces a testosterone, which then, you know, the, the embryo turns into a male, you know, or a female based on, you know, certain things that occur. And because of these phthalates that are in the mom, uh, in this case, um, that you're seeing, I guess you could say less developed males um, that are being born. And I don't know if we want to go down this road tonight, but is that an example, you know, of 100, how 100% there's the classic paper. They look at 200 different um, xenoestrogens 
in a placenta study and they studied, I think it was about a, a thousand, about a, a thousand women were in the study and every single one, every single placenta had all 200 they were looking for, but Jim, all 200. So genetically, every single baby is a XX or XY unless there's a mutation. So boy or girl, but you said that, but, embry but embryologically they're again, boy or girl, but the actual, how the anatomy changes is because everything is female to start off with hormonally until a, until a protein called mullerian inhibitory factor occurs. When that happens, that allows the testosterone to kick in and do its job. Just like, just, like, just like you said, Jim. So when that happens, if that does not kick in, then you'll have malformations of the genitalia. Not the chromosome, but the mal mal malformations of the genitalia. So yes, that's why we're looking at each effect. The generation, say the 10, the 20 year olds right now, they've been in mother's wombs coated in these, ba in these, in these um, phthalates, these endocrine mimickers. So they are starting with a lower value to start off with. But you said something a few minutes ago, Jim, the range is 30, 40 years ago. It's interesting. LabCorp, great lab, uh, June 30th, of 2016, their range for males, adult males, was 350 low, 1197 high. That's a bell curve standard deviations. So listen to number 350 to almost 1200. That's what it was in 2016. On July 1st, 2016, they changed it to 264 to 916. Why? They did a new study, 10,000 people in the study. But if you have 10,000 unhealthy people, the curve is irrelevant. That's why the further back we go, Jim, the further we see a lower, a higher low. About 50 years ago, it was around 800 to 1400. So you're right. It's just what you said. But what it, now, there's no doubt plastics are part of it. There may be other things as well. Uh, lack of iodine, selenium, all these other things. But the key crux is what is the production of testosterone come from? It comes from the production of estrogen. So if you mimic that, you're gonna make less. So let's go to plastics. Um, I think all of us are don't really understand the evolution of how, in this case, bottled water um, is processed. You know, it obviously is in a uh, a plant someplace. You know, the water goes into the bottle, then the bottle gets packaged up, goes into a truck. Um, most cases, the truck's not refrigerated, you know, you potentially could be, you know, processing, excuse me, transporting those, those bottles, uh, plastic bottles and heat. Um, mm -hmm. and then in cold, cause they get, they get refrigerated at some point in time, it could be sitting for three or four months, you know, before it finally hits a, uh, uh, a purchase situation where the human, you know, ends up, you know, ingesting the water, um, during that time, what, why can't they, or what is going on with the plastics? where the chemicals are leaching into the water? Yeah, good good question. Plastics, the, the core compound of plastics are petroleum byproducts, oil. That's, what that's how they actually started. And what's interesting is plastics, they act as like a, a glue or a tape. So when you have a plastic entity, it's going to get coated with whatever you have inside it. Why I bring that up is because if you look at old TV shows on medicine, St. Elsewhere's or Dr. Ben Casey in the 60s. When people got IVs, it was glass because glass was inert. Whatever's inside there did not ad adhere to the glass. They had to actually change the, when we started making medications that were put into plastics, they found out they were getting less of the drug or less of the thing or different interactions because the container is now not inert which is very interesting, right? That should have did some sparks in their heads at, at that point as well. So you have these, there's, there's seven major classes of, uh, of plastics in the environment. Um, and others do the act actors, uh, they're you know, real long names like polyethylene tetraphthalate, okay? So PETs, that's your phthalate, Jim, you talked about at the very beginning. That's the most common. You have these high density um, uh, poly, uh, polyethylenes, you have um, low densities, you have uh, polystyrene, um, you have PVC piping, our water goes through. Again, when the people made these manufacturers, they weren't thinking about hurting people. They think, what's the best way to use it? Because plastic in Greek means mold. It's easy to malleable these plastics. So there are many different forms and shapes that can use them for them, great products. But there are repercussions to this. And we don't have, the studies actually happen in real life, right? 30, 30 40, 50 years of real life, we see these things occur. So what the number one thing that causes the, the damage 
of the plastic itself, the container you talked about already, uh, Jim, is the heat. Heat causes the molecules to change it, its its adherence to itself, and they could the phrase leach out is a real term. Uh, BPA, BPS, those are the one the biggest ones. These bisphosphates that actually could leach out into the water. Um, we deal a lot with our military, Jim, and uh, we deal a lot with their low testosterone. In fact, they're some of the lowest testosterones I have. We're talking active military young men. But they tell me, Greg, man, my water sits in the desert for hours, 130 degrees. Is that where it's coming from? Most likely it's one of the components of it. So that's where it comes from, Jim. Let's talk briefly about BPAs okay. um, because they've been known to cause cancer. Is that correct? There are studies on that too. Yes, sir. And so the... <laughs> huh. It's scary in a way because the number one drink in the world is water and uh, the number one selling uh, product in the world is bottled water. Um, mm -hmm. And it's still amazing to me that water was free, you know, 30 years ago and now we're paying one or $2 for it, um, you know, everywhere we go. So we know that it's there. Um, we know that- Let's go, society... Let's go to cancer real quick, Jim. Certain cancers, mainly reproductive um, endocrine reproductive organ cancers, the endometrial lining, some of the testicular cancers, because this is important to understand, reproductive tissue, gut health as well, are very fast growing cells. So when you have a cell that's more dormant, that doesn't reproduce, there's less chance for this, um, it's called G0, G1, G2, the growth phase of the DNA, when the DNA is duplicating, not duplicating. When, so when, a, when the mechanism is in action faster, there's more chance for a mutation or a defect. That's why these rapid growing cells are more prone to having problems when you have external organs, external stimuli on it, um, you know, chemicals, um, uh, environment aspects of it. Nutrition is a big one too, especially carbohydrates. But yes, Jim, you, you, what you were talking about before is we're drinking – just because glass is brittle doesn't mean there's not ways to use glass. And again, a lot of, a lot of the linings of these packages, all these uh, cardboard boxes, things like that, their plastic linings inside have the same type of thing, the BPA, the BPS, the DETs, the HP, oh, they're all there to keep your food fresh, but there's complications to those. Sure, and obviously it's uh, glass is more, is heavier than, than plastic and you can ship more and mm -hmm. not to worry about dropping it on the floor and breaking exactly. and so on and so forth. Um, so obviously there's a significant practicality and an economic, you know, reason, you know, why plastics have invaded our society. 100%. And good re and good reasons, Jim. It's not that we're not, we're not knocking that just, but now we see repercussions there. We see them very clear in our face. So with that, knowing that there's repercussions, has the health community done anything about that? There's a phenomenal book. I forgot the author's name called Estrogen Nation. It talks about the 10 most common estrogen mimickers in, the, in, in their environment. Red dye 3, red dye 40, BPA, phthalates. Uh, women throwing their birth control pills in the, in the water. It gets into our drinking water. Now, again, I'm not a manufacturer. I'm not doing this. I'm sure there are people out there because uh, environmental science is a phenomenal you know, scientific program. I, I think they are working on that uh, uh, highly, Jim. But some countries have made these some of these products in Europe are blacked out. BPA is cannot be, or BPS, and both of them cannot be in any products, but they're still here. So there is science out there, but the question is, is why are they not being acted upon? Um, me being a constitutional guy, I would say more of a state level than a federal level. I think it is a state function, not a federal function. Okay, so they're out there. Uh, you obviously have treated a lot of patients in the last uh, few years. You mentioned earlier about treating military. Uh, what are you seeing and what is the best way that Optimal Bio uh, can counter, you know, this assault, you know, on our bodies? Well, we, we look at the whole person first, Jim. So the first thing we want to talk about is you mentioned it, Jim. Water was free 30 years ago. So the most, the most, without water, we're dead in a couple of weeks. And we have the most abundant water, but it's to get to other people, how we get it to people, right? So we need it. So I, I, in, in, in the book, Esther's Nation, he recommended um, the most important things, filter your water. Find a great water filter system. Yes, you get one for the house, that's great. There's, and we're talking cost, but there's ways to do it cheaply. Right at your water faucet, the one you're going to ingest in your water every day. Uh, I personally, he recommended too, a, a, royal, a royal Berkey system. Put in there, filters of water, gets rid of all the plastics, all the fungus, all the, all the, the virus. It does everything. It's phenomenal. It's, it's a two-stage system. So that's one thing I recommend. Everybody get a water filter. Do their research on which brand you recommend. That's number one. But Jim, 
we can't make our, our gonads, our, our ovaries, our testicles, make more of these hormones. It just cannot be done. Uh, in, in certain ways with certain exercises, maybe a, a 10, 30, 40 points. But to actually make to produce more, you can't. But we can give the product at the levels that are optimal that mimic them uh, so your body knows what to do with them. So the production within our body, we can enhance. But we could take the chemical that it used to make, and this is important, bioidentical. So it's atom for atom, molecule for molecule, the three-dimensional shape, its function, its structure, its elimination is identical. Your body cells that utilize these will not know where they came from. They'll go, oh, I'm making more. So I think that's the way to do and get the levels optimal. But, what, but why is it important? Testosterone has over 400 functions in our body. It's not just for libido. It's in fact, that's like one of the fifth reasons people come to us. It's tiredness, brain fog, uh, as you age, uh, muscle being developed, bone formation in women. We can spend hours just talking about those, Jim. But what we can do, Jim, is we can replace what our bodies used to make at the optimal levels. So when you do that, though, what happens to all the plastics that are in somebody's body? There is the body just putting them on to the side where it doesn't affect the estrogen anymore. Or like, kind of walk us through what happens when you've kicked in the tos- kicked up the testosterone in a, in a body. Our, what happens is these receptor sites, the body has to break these things down and plastic is very difficult to break down. I want to make sure I get this correct. There was a paper written about six months ago and I, and I believe it was an, an, an average American eats a credit card worth of plastic a month. I don't think it's a month. I'm almost sure it's a month. So those plastics don't leave the body of the individual. They get stored usually in the fat because the fat is the best way for our body to store these damaging things so they don't cause further damage to other cells. There are some detoxifications, some chelating programs, but plastic is it's hard, Jim. What's really in those cells are in those cells. So how your body lyses and breaks those down is very important, but it needs a healthy immune system, a detoxification system from the liver. It's a three-stage process. So that's what our body, so a healthy cell, i.e. with our vitamin Ds, our testosterones, our estrogen, progesterones, they have a better immune system to help fight and detox these plastics. But I don't believe we could ever get rid of them fully, Jim. I think the repercussions we could try to minimize by optimizing our hormones. So you brought up a point about vitamin D and some other supplements. Uh, do they actually help? Obviously, they rebuild. They help make the cell stronger and what have you. And is that in turn, you know, in some way or shape or form, try to help evacuate some of these toxins in our body? Oh, yes, for sure, Jim. Especially vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is number D because it's the fourth vitamin isolated, A, B, C, D. We now know 30 years ago, vitamin D, you know, less, more than that, is not a vitamin. A vitamin is a necessary cofactor for a system to work properly. They're not optional. But this certain brand, vitamin D, is actually a secosteroid. It's actually the same structure biochemically as cholesterol, testosterone, estrogen. They're called gonanes in this class. Uh, we found out since we, you know, the science has isolated the genome, we know that of the 23,000 genes, 3,000 of our genes actually have a receptor site for vitamin D. Uh, we've heard about this last 18 months of cytokine storm. A high vitamin D decreases cytokine storm. So there's when you say, what does it do, Jim? There's over 3,000 you know, 3, receptor sites with multiple functions, but it strengthens the cell, therefore the organ and the system to, yes, fight these, these, these um, innocuous uh, products on our body, the damage they do. Because what they do, Jim, is this. Besides blocking receptor sites and, and turning off the machines, they form these um, free radicals. A free radical, electrons are in pairs. When they're in pairs, they're, they're doing their job. But if one's gone, you have one, you have one electron in an orbit by itself, that's a free radical. And that now causes damage because it's looking to get another pair somewhere. And when they take it from other cells, that causes the inflammation, the, uh, the other immune responses. That's why vitamin C can donate two electrons. Vitamin E can donate one. Glutathione actually gives, gives uh, electrons back to them. So it's a system of scavenging your body to try to cover these free radicals. So you want less damage as possible, the free radicals will be de- it can be decreased. So getting back to testosterone, uh, you got people coming in, you know, let's say their levels are, you know, two or 300 if they're males and you're getting them back up to what they should be. Um, what are some of the you know, two month post placement uh, things that they should be experiencing? Well, there's really good is this. It's like the number one reason people see us at Optimal Bio 
regardless of gender, regardless of age, 18, 90, doesn't matter. Tired of being tired. And number two is brain fog. So what I love to do is after a month, we we, play, we check the numbers to see they're in the right path, right? Or we use the, the numbers or guideposts. We don't want to say a number, hey, you're optimistic, you should feel good. No, we want to know is how do you feel? And they'll start telling us, Jim, wow, I'm remembering my words. I remember my friend Bob again. Um, in mid, the mid-afternoon, instead of me being tired, I'm, I'm hitting tennis balls and playing golf. Um, my wife and I are going on dates in the early afternoon, whatever. It's not they're not having that when they come home from work, they're on the couch and they're out. They're telling us what's going away. That's why I really love to hear when they come in for their consult is to hear their symptoms first because that's how I grade myself. I grade us at success when they come in with their five, six major complaints. I ask them how they feel and that will be our answer. And our goal is to have their incremental benefits in all of those. So I'm jumping around again. I'm going back, back to water because it just reminded me of something. Uh, your mother-in-law, my mother, um, in their 80s, um, drink coffee every morning. Uh, probably debate and potentially fight with you at times um, when, you know, they're out in the heat, you know, for a little while. And you say, hey, mom, you got to drink some water. And, you know, they reluctantly might take a couple of sips or whatever, but they're simply just not water drinkers. And they're living to ripe old ages and they're extremely healthy. Is there a, this myth out there that, you know, we've been told you must drink, you know, half a gallon of water a day or, you know, 12 ounces every two hours or whatever the metrics are. Um, does the body really need that much water? Yes, based upon size. But my, my mother-in-law was a cardiologist last week and, and he and I were talking about the same thing, but the amount of coffee they drink, think about it. It's virtually all water, Jim. So they're getting their water. The question is how much diuretic effects does the caffeine have? And we were here, uh, great cardiologist, we were yapping about that. And he, he's fine over his career that it's not as, so coffee drinking is not as bad as people say it is. Okay, so the coffee, they're getting their water. So the answer, that's fine. No water is death. So they're getting the water. We know that because our cells are about 70% water, you know, weight, water by weight. So yeah, I wouldn't fight with them. They're, they're older than us. They own us anyway. They're smarter than us. They've lived to 80 something. This is enjoy that. But yeah, but there's no doubt, Jim, without water, we know from multiple papers. Now, how much that is, um, I, I, I do, I do eat eight to 12 glasses, huge 12 ounce glasses. I love, I start my day every day with three glasses of water. I just, I think it's, I think the studies show that pretty well. Um, I like how that ages. We know dehydration is not good, but the answer is what the myth is. Not a myth, Jim, but there are different ways. Now, if you tell me you're drinking Coke as your symptom, even though it's mostly water, no, no, no. You got your sugar. Well, I'm drinking diet because spend a whole time, maybe we'll do sugar down the future on how bad these so-called artificial sugars are, what they do to the brain and nervous system. So no, there's what's, what also is in this water is crucially important. Okay, so you are not necessarily an opponent of, you know, somebody walking around with a water bottle all day long. Of course, in this case, a metal water bottle uh, and, you know, drinking the proper amount of fluid every single day. Since that's me and that's you, I believe in it, but I know you can get water from other sources, but they need it. Also think about it. Food, a steak is more water than people think, right? There's water in so many things that our body is so amazing at absorbing the nutrients it needs. And that's the first one it gets. So that being said, people are getting more water than they think. But I don't want to make it a torture. They got to cut the, that big gallon jugs. They walk around and you know, in in BPA plastic in the heat all day. That's that's probably defeating the purpose. So no, but um, we know they would not be healthy, or they would not be eating eighty nine or ninety if they did not have enough water. Period. But why? But filter. I can't, and I don't know how they got with uh, the filter water. Jim is so important to get all that all that stuff out that is detrimental to the body because remember the body is phenomenal at surviving in harsh harsh environments but our whole goal is that you strive in these environments yeah, i always wanted to kind of had a debate you know with myself that you'd see you know people that you work with they come in and uh they would go to the water cooler and it's obviously one of those big you know plastic containers uh filled with water it's supposed to be you know from some special spring someplace in the u.s and they have, uh, you know, a, a mimic, you know, let's say, you know, half a gallon jug, you know, of plastic, empty plastic that they're filling that water bottle up with every single day. And I'm just thinking they're just getting, you know, basically a double dose of plastic, you know, day in and day out. There are, there are some, Jim, there are some BPA and BPS free plastics. There are some papers showing that they're, they're okay. They're, they're, they're good. 
But when we talked before you and I the other day is what would be the best. And that to me is different than good. I would still take a stainless steel, uh, an, a glass uh, over any of those things. But there are some plastics out there that, again, we talked about the benefits of plastic, light, mobile, uh, chance for shape, a lot of things it could do. And we have smart scientists out there doing that. So there are some out there that, that are, my personally, I'm still a glass guy. But you're right. We don't, but it's important. We first went BPA and they got rid of it and gave BPS. It was the same foul, it's the same problem. So we got to understand we have to do, as being a consumer, we have to do our research. Sure. I mean, ultimately, are you better off just going to the tap and uh, taking a glass of water as opposed to buying a bottle of water? I would, I would think so, Jim, because some, if you look at some of those major names that put those in those bottles you paid two bucks for, it, it says in it, it comes from city water and they add certain minerals and stuff to it. So how about we just get city water and filter it in your house and bring it to yourself in a glass container? That's what I would do. Um, but yeah, I understand. But yeah, drinking water. You and I have been around the world, Jim. We've done stuff, um, the mission work on the world. And I'm literally taking these Berkey filters through dirty swamp water filter and drinking it. So they're amazing filters. But without water, I take crummy water versus no water. But we're fortunate. We have an opportunity to make a choice. Let's make a choice and avoid. We, like you said at the very beginning, we don't know how long these things are packaged in the heat, in the, you know, in the trucks coming here. We have no idea how much leached out. We just don't know. And there's no problem with all these chemicals with bottled water, correct? Again, depends what goes in the kit. Whatever's in the bottled water that came in the water, if there's chemicals, that's going to be the problem. But the bottled water itself will not change what's in the container. Right. Okay. All right. Back to uh, our patient profile and testosterone. <sighs> I ran into an individual the other day. He's uh, 77 years old, um, decided to uh, get the treatment. And I was with him actually last night. Uh, he's amazing at his age. He's wanted to go play cornhole last night at 930 at night. And um, I'm thinking to myself, man, if and I didn't, I'm 58 years old. So <laughs> mm. uh, I'm thinking to myself, man, if I'm his age someday and I have his energy, um, you know, I'm going to feel pretty good about myself. One of his concerns, though, is... Uh, and I think he may have misunderstood, but he's been doing some research and he's wants to continue with the treatments, but he's wondering if there's any studies, um, uh, because he's concerned about the long-term effect. So let's say he stays on until he's 90 or 95. Um, he's worried about the long-term effects of being on, on the BHRT. Is there, can you, can you uh, expand upon that? Yeah, decrease uh, sarcopenia, decrease osteoporosis, decrease cardiovascular disease, decrease neurogenic disease. See, here's the whole, here's the whole fallacy. If we had thyroid um, disease where you had, or you had your thyroid taken out for some reason, do we give you age-appropriate thyroid hormone? No, you give what's optimal to run the body. If you lose insulin, do we give you age-appropriate insulin to run your body? No. But when you lose gonads over your testicles, it's an age appropriate level. That may, there's no scientific studies. There. There's no sense to that. So if he wants to feel back like he was, and you know, as he aged, then we'll get the aging process of that. Now, are there complications? Here's the big one, Jim. Testosterone therapy increases prostate cancer. Give me, give me 90 seconds. That's a paper from 1941 by the famous Dr. Huggins and Dr. Hodges in night at University of Chicago. In fact, Dr. Huggins won the Nobel Prize in 1963. We're talking real great research. I'm not going to mock the researchers. They're brilliant. But this famous study was the paper who had one man in the study. One. One. And he already was castrated, which is important because... There is no testosterone being made, and the prostate gland itself gets saturated when your um, testosterone is 90 nanograms per deciliter. So anything less than that potentially could make a could make a tumor grow. But if you're over 90, whatever you take can never, ever make it grow. Dr. Morgan Dell at Harvard wrote a great book called Testosterone for Life, and not just that lay book. He's wrote multiple papers showing the benefits of patients with prostate cancer on testosterone actually living longer because having less heart attack, stroke, and dementia. So if you feel, why would you stop something if it helps the benefit of that? Um, back to our plastic point. 
what's increasing um, bladder cancer, prostate cancer, are the plastics. It's in the environment. So we're going to take these chemicals that are destroying the actual hormone that helps keep us healthier. Why not keep continuing that hormone? So I don't see anything with that, Jim. Not at all. Mayo Clinic says there is now and there's never been any evidence to show that testosterone therapy increases or causes prostate cancer or benign, uh, benign uh, prostate hypertrophy. So you're telling me that they ran a study with one male who was castrated? Yes. And that's what Morgan thought. He actually, in his book, he says, I went to the Harvard Library. I found the paper, read it myself. Yes. I mean, this day and age, I don't want to get into a vaccine discussion, but uh, the FDA and the CDC are upset with ivermectin and some of these other potential treatments because they're not doing these uh, massive randomized, you know, placebo studies. And, you know, in this case, we're taking a paper with one person. Yeah, and that's the thing, Jim, to also these high idea of the, the classic paper of, you know, placebo evidence study, all that kind of stuff. On a side note, Jim, there's never been a vaccine paper ever with a placebo of normal saline, just on a side note. So, but back to this, we have 70 years, 50 years of these things. Uh, the pellets have been used in women since 1935, men 1937. They've been used longer than shots, came out five, seven years later. Creams were almost 40 years later. Here's the thing, Jim, is we have, there's not anecdotal evidence. We have patients for 70 years taking these things with no increases in things. But then we have study, I'll give you an example. 1947, they have an oral, an oral version of testosterone. We make 17 beta. Uh, it's a structural thing. They made the oral methyl 17 alpha. By just changing that structure, they knew within a few years, increased liver cancer and clots. They pulled it off the market. Well, it's not off the market. People still use it, but there's studies to show that. So my thing is you don't need it. You don't need these studies sometimes when you have something such as, say, an ivermectin used for 50 years with no side effects. But back to our pellets. There's never been a pellet recall of a natural bioidentical pellet in any country since 1935. You're talking millions, millions of papers taken. The patients, not papers, million. But we know we have a lot of data on that. In fact, as you know, in optimal bio, we're working on a book now. I've collected about 7,000 papers showing the benefits of the route and the hormones themselves we're put together. So with the bioidentical hormone, it's obviously placed in, under, in your body, mm -hmm. um, usually underneath the epidermis and the fat part of your body. What is it actually, does it just leach over time uh, in a very stable way to maintain your high levels of hormones compared to the shots, compared to the creams and other let's, applications? Let's get rid of the word leach. That's bad. Let's get the word <laughs> <laughs> dissolve. So the, the, the pellet is 99.5%. So it's the structure and the route leads to how it works. Because it's a cylinder, when you lose, you know, a very small molecule every few milliseconds from the cylinder, the shape stays the same for a long time as it dissolves slowly. So it's a steady state and it will, it will, so it just dissolves into the third space fluid, which bottom goes to your, goes to your blood system and how endocrine glands work, the test, the, um, the pancreas, uh, the gonads, it secretes the hormone into the bloodstream, like the highway and the cells that need it, grab it. It's not like a nerve that goes from the brain to the toe. It doesn't, it doesn't, it does not, 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 doesn't do that way. What it does is it goes in. So every cell it needs, it gets it. So now you have this, basically you're, you're transplanting a testicle or transplanting an ovary under the skin and the subcutaneous and the fat area that's very, very vascular. So therefore it just dissolves slowly uh, and steady state. Now, what's cool about this, you work out, uh, you get a faster heart rate, you get a bump of testosterone and it goes and does its job. I didn't mean to use the word leech. I, all this water I discussion. I'm just, just joking. You know. <laughs> <laughs> leeching a bad word. It's funny that because it does. It is leeching out exactly what it does, Jim. It just sits there. But this is a good product leeching out into our bloodstream to go to cells to do a great function. But the cool part of bioidentical, Jim, that you think about the function, it's not just the function. It's the shape of the molecule because the body recognizes it. So it's a perfect. Um, it's a one for one function. It's not like too weak or too strong, but the most important part of taking bioidentical, it's the elimination because it goes down the exact same pathway. Our body's built to eliminate these hormones. There's no buildup. There's no extra products. Some of, some of these detoxification, like the plastic you talked about, our body's never seen these things. It goes, how do I get rid of this? It's not like that at all. Obviously it's been very successful since it's been around since 1935. And anything that competes with this pellet at this point in time? I, I miss your story. I'm sorry. I should have done that. The, this, the shot, the cyprinate, the ethrane, the propanate 
what happens with that is it gets high very fast and goes down very fast. The classical roller coaster. But the so-called roid rage gym is not when it's high, it's when it's dropping. Creams, the Androgels, those kind of brands, they uh, are they are roller coaster at a lower level. Uh, they're very rare, but there's a complication. There's a a certain um, chemical or plate thing called thromboxane A2, which actually helps our blood clot. It's very important, but it's been shown in those type of modes of applications. Again, very rare, but they're there that it actually can increase clotting with those forms. Um, not with ours. Ours is when I say ours. The, in the generation bioidentical pellets is not so that because all we have in our pellet is 99.5% pure 17 beta testosterone. The binding agent to hold the powder in the mold is a natural fat, either steric acid or cholesterol. I prefer cholesterol because the, the structure is mimics testosterone. Um, so yeah, Jim, it's, it's really cool is how it works is your body just does its stuff and eliminates this stuff. There's benefits to synthetics uh, in the sense of testosterone, the shot itself, the actual molecule that works the testosterone is not synthetic. It's the ester that holds it together to allow it to sit in the muscle. That is what is not normal for our bodies. So that's why it's important. I said, why not, if you lose X, why not give our body X? That's what I'm thinking. But back to our range at the very beginning we talked about. Why settle for a normal standard bell curve from 10,000 sick people? You know, because the question is when, I, I had a friend, you know, you asked your doctor, what if I walked in, my level is 1500, what would you do? And they had, well, nothing. Well, therefore it tells you it's not, it's not a poison. It's nothing, it's just the opposite of that. So your friend at 77, is, does he feel great at 77? Stay on it, I feel great at 87. You know, God's in charge of the heart. But if God says the heart keeps going, we're okay. You brought up an interesting point this before that I don't think the public really knows about. When they get these lab ranges, you're saying that they're, they sample 10,000 people or some random amount yep. and whether you're sick or not that's what becomes the new the new range 100 percent. the paper the reason i'm using ten thousand. that was the paper that womack used Ten thousand healthy people between uh, 25 and 55 or 25 and 80 I, whatever that paper is but they don't wean people out they get the average schmo like you and me and th then they have the bell curve so what a what a standard bell curve is you have ten thousand. you plot all these points in the mean the middle of it you put the peak that's your bell. That's your top of your bell. And you go one standard deviation each side and there's your curve. And these things fall and fall out. But again, if you just say you had, we were golfers. What if you had uh, 10,000, 20 handicappers and what they shoot, that could be a higher score. You get 10 to 10,000 pros be a different bell curve. So right. therefore, you know, a crappy numbers in crappy numbers out, good numbers in good numbers out. So, that's why, that's what I, I mean, Jim, I'm an OBGYN. I'm an endocrine specialist of women. I trained in this stuff. I never really asked the question of ranges because I figured they did all the work. They did. Their work they do is great, but what's your source? And what got me, Jim, was that date was, was I started looking back at a paper I found back when I was a resident where the range for women is around upper limits was considered high was 200, 220. Now upper limits is 41. So my question is, why was a five fold change? Boom. That's a look at a men for ourselves. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, why, why is Gramps 1400 is okay. Boom. Now there are side effects to also other shots is making the blood too thick, watch your estrogen levels. But when you have physiological optimal levels, those are very rare occurrences. So what we do at Optimal Bios, we will free fall everything very closely. But this is important. Testosterone converts to estrogen. Men need estrogen. Too low estrogen affects the heart and the brain and the genital area. A lot of people block that conversion. That's a no-no. There are three ways to get rid of estrogen. It's two, 16, and four. Two is the optimal way. There's an herb made out of broccoli and cauliflower. How healthy is that? That makes it go that pathway. So I think knowing the biochemistry, and I'm even talking for lay people, engineers, scientists, anybody. When we draw the pictures out, when you see A, or a go to B goes this direction, it just let our body do what it needs to do. Not let's try to make a different, a different um, pathway. So then with cholesterol, oh, here we go. When they, <laughs> you knew I was going down here, right? Uh, are they deciding the same ranges for cholesterol the same way they decide the same ranges for test, uh, for testosterone? Okay. I'm, I'm 61. When I was in med school, the high cholesterol was 330. Now today it's 180. There's a, a very, very well-written doctor named Dr. Mark Houston. He wrote, he wrote a couple of books. What, what your doctor has never told you about cardiovascular disease and what your doctor never told you about hypertension. I recommend those books. He's was at Vanderbilt for years. He's now at his own clinic. Um, 
So he talks about atherosclerosis being an inflammatory disease, not a high cholesterol disease. Dr. Miller, one of the most famous um, heart surgeons in America, said blaming cholesterol for atherosclerosis is like blaming a fireman who's at your house putting a fire out. So what happened was this whole cholesterol thing in 1958, Ansel Keys, um, K rations for those in the military, he, he wrote that he invented those. He looked at 38 countries to figure his hypothesis through every country out but seven. And he picked this algorithm. Italy to be in the big one, but Italy was post-World War. They had no meats or eggs. They had to eat off that kind of diet. But it wasn't beneficial. That's the problem here. He, he, he cherry-picked the numbers. What I'm saying is, in every book, we know that. So, and cholesterol is oil. Blood is water. Oil and water don't mix. So blood cannot carry cholesterol. It must be wrapped in something that likes water. That's a lipoprotein. So the problem is too many lipoprotein particles. That's the boat. Cholesterol is the passenger. So when the boat is damaged, i.e. high sugar again, causes inflammatory damage in the artery, then the cholesterol goes into that area. Then your immune response happens. So back to your idea of cholesterol. In your, if you, in, 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 there's a thing called melvonic acid, which turns into cholesterol. That's where statins work. So what does cholesterol become? Because whatever statins block, it's going to decrease that. So what does cholesterol block? It becomes testosterone estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, uh, red blood cells, myelin sheath, 95% of your brain, 50% of every cell membrane. It's just not that simple, Jim. That's the problem. The biggest culprit in our society, even more than plastics, it's sugar. And I think that's our next topic coming up pretty soon. Yeah, we'll save that for a later time. But So you're saying that the sugar then damages the artery. Back to our free radicals again, Jim. Yep. Right. And then for lack of a better term, the cholesterol in effect fills that void or, or that's its job. It's the band aid to block the hole. Exactly. But the problem is, is, is that you have, and don't get me wrong. There are certain particular people that need statins for high particle numbers, not for high cholesterol for high particle numbers. First thing is diet sugar, but there's rare cases that people need stats to lower the number particle number. If you have more particles, more chance of damage lower particles. So that's very, very important. So I'm not poo-pooing cholesterol. I'm not saying that. And there are genetic malformations. Alzheimer's is now, it's a, there's a gene called APOE and you have, you have one, two, three, four alleles. Those with a four, four are much more prone to Alzheimer's. Uh, that, that, that protein APOE is a cholesterol metabolizing problem, but what causes it to be more out of whack? Another name for Alzheimer's disease now is type three diabetes. Again, sugar's the culprit. What it does is extra sugar sorry, Jim, binds to proteins. When it binds to proteins, it changes the structure of the protein. Therefore, changes the, 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 the structure will change its function. That's why the nerve, the tangles and the, and the Alzheimer's, uh, hemoglobin A1C, those things happen. And every cell picks up that cholesterol. What's really weird, Jim, is fructose even does it worse, seven times worse it's called AGE, um, advanced, um, uh, advanced glycinated in products. I got that's for our sugar talk. And obviously, the fake sugars are just as bad as the regular sugars. Even worse, they destroy the nerve connection in the brain. They're made from petroleum byproducts. We'll spend a whole half hour, an hour talking about what they do to the body, and and liver disease. All right, so. Uh, Walk us through in a very simple way the relationship between testosterone and cholesterol again. Okay. Testosterone comes from cholesterol. So cholesterol is the precursor to all sex or steroid hormones. If you look at Optimal Bio's website, we have that four rings. It has three um, hexagons and one pentagon. They form together. That's the backbone of all of our hormones, sex hormones. Because the other hormones are protein hormones, like insulin's a protein hormone. Thyroid's a protein hormone. The sex hormones are steroid hormones. And the, the precursor is cholesterol has 27 carbons, testosterone has 19, estrogen is 18, um, and progesterone does. So what it does is it has to take those off. So what it is is cholesterol becomes testosterone, becomes estrogen, becomes progesterone, becomes cortisol, all those things. So if an individual, for example, has been assaulted by plastics, and then on top of that, they're on statins that are reducing cholesterol, they're really assaulting their 
their hormones, their, their sex heart, hormones. their heart and their brain. In fact, the studies are clear on um, clear on um, increased dementia because the brain's ninety five percent cholesterol. There are ways there again. There are people that need them. So what you do is in the mitochondria, that is the nuclear power cell uh, organelle in the cell that takes oxygen energy and it pushes these electrons called a protein gradient down proton gradient down this membrane and get energy it's like a battery. And, and ubiquitol is another product of cholesterol. So you don't want to decrease mitochondria, you decrease energy. So if you have to be on a stat, you could take you, but coenzyme Q10. There's also one called ANAGDOT. Dr. Houston actually, uh, actually pioneered that. That actually will uh, uh, protect the heart, which is the statins cause rhabdomyolysis muscle, break, muscle breakdown. Those two will actually help so you get the benefits of the statins. There are some benefits for them for certain, mainly the anti-inflammatory part of statins, but then protects what cholesterol is supposed to make. That's another topic for another time as well. Oh, you brought cholesterol up, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, this obviously has been a refresher and very, uh, to me, it's always very interesting to, you know, go back and, and learn again and, um, you know, in effect, ground yourself, you know, with, with, you know, some of these fundamentals that uh, I think all of us who are looking for optimal health, you know, need to really think about. And, you know, people have come to me and, you know, ask me about um, testosterone and BHRT. And I said, look, you know, after I've talked to them, if you're still skeptical, just simply go next time you get a physical, um, you know, go get your testosterone tested and, um, uh, you know, look at your PSA and obviously some other things as well. And, and then, you know, from there, if you want us to take a look at it, we certainly can do that. Uh, any other recommendations uh, for, you know, patients that are, well, I wouldn't call them patients yet for people that might be considering, you know, getting treatment? The most valuable object you own is yourself. Aren't you worth the expiration? And don't take our word for any of this. You must do research. But Greg, when I go on, when I go look around, I find uh, contradictions. Yeah, you do. There is a left, there's a right, there's a middle, there's all that. I understand that. But you know your body. But Greg, it's a normal part of aging. No, 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 it isn't. That's the problem. That's the problem here about there's a normal part of aging. It isn't. It isn't. And that's what bothers me is to hear that that's the normal part of aging. No, we are going to age. I love aging and gracefully. I think it's wonderful. But we don't have to speed the process up. And we're in a environment, Jim. We just touch this, just the surface of plastics today. We could talk about, you know, thousands of fragrances, Jim, aren't even done by the FDA because there's so much stuff in it. They're preparatory. You can't put them in. There's no studies on these things. The book, Estrogenation, I've, I've read the doctor's name, I told you. He goes through how many things we don't know what's out there. So what do you do own, Jim? You own your body. Let's get that immune system. Let's get that muscle skeletal system. Let's get that endocrine system, the cardiovascular system, our diet as healthy as possible. And you could go back to the mid seventies and see how our health deteriorated. The moment we made sugar, low fat, high carbohydrate diet, that's the problem. So we'll spend time maybe in the future talking about the proper way of eating and, and scientific papers on this, but we need to have the way we ate 150 years ago with good hygiene. That was their lacking. We have good hygiene, good food. Your body is, you, you can look around the world, Jim, where longevity lasts. It's these islands off Japan, these islands off the, of Greece. They're eating, you know, things that grow out of the ground, free range this, free range that, drinking a ton of water, and they have their wine and little stuff. That's not a problem. But make your system, you, you control as best you can be. Again, I, it sounds corny, but yes, we can survive, but I want to thrive until as long as we have. Well, like I said, I always say, if you want to stay average, stay average. If you want to do more, you know, you can certainly do more. As always, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Please My check pleasure, us out Jim. at www.optimalbio.com. Uh, we have lots of podcasts. We have lots of content, you know, that's there. And uh, check us out on Instagram also, Facebook, and pretty much every other platform you could possibly think of this day and age. Um, until next time. Dr. Brandon, thank you very much and have a great night. You too, Jim. Thank you very much.